Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The cypress trees and the Spanish moss, kind of an ethereal feel to it. You can't really experience cattle unless you get out on it. We're all about research, taking what we learn out to the public. An idea was formed and we just built on it. It all depends upon the teacher and how they can bring the excitement into the classroom. And for me, it's bringing all the reptiles and amphibians. When you see it all from above, you see how we've left our mark on virtually every aspect of the coast. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks, Guts, Glory, Ram. My name is Lee Smith, and I was part of a crew who videotaped for four days along the entire Texas Gulf Coast. I was born and raised in Houston, so I thought I had a pretty good idea of what our coast was all about. But when you see it all from above, you see how intertwined man is with his environment. How we've left our mark on virtually every aspect of the coast and how special the areas are that are still natural.
So after four days and traveling 600 miles, we saw how man's presence has dominated the landscape, how commerce has dictated what that landscape looks like. But our environment is still bigger and more powerful than we are. And it's always a good idea to reflect on that. Cadillac is unique because it is the largest bald cypress swamp in the south, if not in the United States. Paddling trails here on Cadillac will get you back into some habitat that is just not everywhere. It's, it's unique. It gets you into a place that you may have never seen before. Five trails here on Cata Lake. We have Hell's Half Acre, Carter Chute Trail, the Cathedral Trail, Turtle Shell Trail, and the Old Folks Playground Trail. Okie dokie. To get the people out here and to experience that uniqueness, the trails really help us do that. Really get to experience the surroundings and the sounds. Right over the, the green stuff there, you can just see his head. There's a great white egret over there. I've lived in Marshall most of my life, which is, uh, uh, I'm almost 70 years old. What's interesting, I guess, is, is the, the age and the beauty of the, of the cypress trees and the Spanish moss. It has an, kind of an ethereal feel to it. You can't really, experience Caddo unless you get out on it. I think everything about it is unique. <laughs> you can't find this, well, really anywhere else. All the network of canals and the, the swampiness of it and the way it, it attracts the birds. I just feel real close to the earth when I'm here. Cata Lake is different every season. You can't just come one season and see it all. It is different every day. You gotta get out on the boat, you gotta get in the swamp, and you really gotta sit down and you gotta sit and listen. It's beyond words to describe how wonderful this place is. It's just unreal. I'm Justin. I'm Fernando. I'm Daniel. I'm Lisa. I'm Bjorn. And, and we're, we're the Feral Swine, Swine Research, Research Team. Team. That's right, the Feral Swine Research Team. Go back a little bit. It may sound funny, and look crazy, but this team at the Kerr Wildlife Management Area is on a serious mission. The feral swine pose a significant ecological threat. They are an invasive species. There's a lot of country that's been destroyed by them. With feral pigs spreading faster than hunters can manage them, this team is investigating other ways to control this multiplying menace. And nothing else was being done on the topic of, you know, their population growing and, and spreading very rapidly. It was just a real easy yes, we ought to look into that. The first step was to construct a research facility like no other in the world. There's no directions out there on how to build a feral swine research pen. It was pretty much starting from scratch. We built something and tried it to see how it worked and made improvements. Here they go, going into the gate. Close it! Woo! <laughs> we're, we're handling animals in a fashion that we haven't had to do previously. Uh, we're purchasing things that we've never purchased before. 
And purchasing is where Lisa Wally comes in. Her welfare fairy. While her co-workers wrestle the pigs, oh, you did? she okay. wrestles the paperwork. Deal. I would much rather be out there wrestling pigs, yes. <laughs> Early experiments to make pig baits more palatable led to one of many unusual purchase requests. Syrup. Buying gallons of pancake syrup. There is state contract syrup available, but the pigs don't care for it. <laughs> They only prefer butter flavored. What's the secret of your syrup recipe? Real butter. This is Butterworth. <laughs> Little do they know that their syrup is good for a hog attractant. <laughs> I never thought of that. I did. The flavor itself seems agreeable to them, and that's promising. Well, the other day when I did that, well, how was it like an hour? About an hour and a half. About an hour and a half. We were good as a team. Let's go, pigs. This crew, we get along great. There you go. We have the same sense of humor, so that makes the day go by good. Have you done something different with your mustache? Nobody notices but you. <laughs> <laughs> While the work is not always pretty, and help for landowners may still be years away, this team has what it takes to see Almost things through. 10, 20. The more effort that we put into it, uh, the closer we get. I am very proud to work with the folks at Kerr WMA. It's a good place to work. Every day is kind of like just going next door to help your neighbor out. It, some days doesn't even really feel like work. Right here, one, two, and three. This is beautiful. He says that to everybody. Oh, mm -hmm. This is a wonderful team, wonderful bosses and co-workers. Give me a goofy shot real quick. Come on, guys, goofy. It is certainly a team effort. Come on, let's get crazy. Woo! A day at the freshman campus of Kingwood High School near Houston is like a day at most modern high schools. Students balance schoolwork and socializing, cope with cliques and peer pressure, and consider their futures. All the while, teachers face the daily challenge of keeping their coursework relevant and of making learning interesting to kids with plenty of other things on their minds. We have living stuff in there. We also have to have what? Non-living. Bringing okay. studies alive in a classroom can be difficult, even when studying life itself. What else? Biology textbooks and pickled specimens in jars can't always do the trick. You're going to be opening up and taking a look at your ecosystems. For eager young minds and sleepy teenagers, something more hands-on is often the key to sparking an interest in learning. I think I got one. Just ask biology teacher Mike Furry. That's just muck floating around in there. I've been teaching here for 13 years. And, you know, teaching biology is fun. It's like a hobby. It all depends upon the teacher and how they can relate to the students and how they can bring the excitement into the classroom. And for me, it's bringing all the reptiles and amphibians. Mike keeps his classes exciting by keeping a classroom zoo. He got it. The students help care for exotic frogs, a boa constrictor, and more. <laughs> In the back, we do have the resident colony of the Madagascar hissing roaches. They are big, interesting bugs, and I still keep them just to get uh, a reaction from the kids. Then we've got uh, the salamander. I bought two of those things at a bait shop, but that one has just developed into a nice, uh, friendly critter to keep in the classroom. And then in that next tank is a critter that I inherited. That's what you call a three-toed amphiuma. It's got to be at least 24 years old. And uh, who knows how long that thing is going to live. The classroom also hosts a few guests from the Gulf of Mexico. The aquarium was donated to the school. I have a fascination with what's in the ocean. And uh, where we live here in the Houston area, uh, we have a grand opportunity to go down there and collect stuff and bring it up. It's very inexpensive to do. It just takes a little time, and, and that's it. So let's pile in. Okay. So one weekend every fall, while he could be enjoying a day off, Mike rounds up some vehicles, parents and colleagues, and takes a group of students to Galveston Island State Park for some real-world biology. Can't learn it all from textbook, can't learn it all from computer software. My strategy is let the kids see it, let the kids participate, let the kids do it. At the State Park, Students get a chance to get their feet wet, completely wet, 
as marine biologists for a day. It wasn't pike fishing here earlier. I've had a couple of students in the past make career decisions, you know, decide what they would now like who, to study. Who's going to be a marine biologist? Mm -hmm. yes. Do they want to really? do something with science or not? You know, because they get a real exposure to that in here. Um, this one's a male because you see it's got this long, narrow point. You know, a couple of the kids have never been exposed to any saltwater organism. They didn't realize that when they get into the water that all these things are swimming around in the water. And uh, eyes are opening up and look at all the different types of crabs. Look at all these different types of jellyfish. You know, look at these different types of fish that are there. Silver sides. You catch like a puffer fish or something for the first time, they've never seen it. They really get excited, really light up. Uh, some of the pipe fish sometimes are... And, uh, anchovies occasionally, you get a, a, a big stir from, from those a lot of times. There's also anchovies out there um, that we caught. Uh, the hermit crabs will. A park ranger guides the class in catching and identifying a living library of sea life and lets the class know what's okay to take with them at the end of their day. We do get some small trout occasionally and, and redfish and stuff, which uh, all have length limits because they are game fish. Some do better than in tanks and aquariums, and some do better um, just being let go real quick. Those people in the state parks, they've got the education, they know the environment, they know the critters, they know the rules, and Hans down there at Galveston Island State Park has just been invaluable. We started out with eight fish total. Back at school, the students maintain a saltwater aquarium full of living reminders of their trip to the beach, which they continue to learn from for the rest of the year. I always take a quick look at it, and I found uh, one fish in the clutches of one of the crabs. The kids that have been on field trips always gather around the aquarium and take a look and see how things are doing. And of course, when they gather around, then other students in the classroom gather around. Part of the prey-predator relationship. Though it is unusual for teachers to use state parks as lending libraries, all over Texas, educators have discovered that their local state parks make excellent science labs. Hey, we're all in our group. Which way do we go? Are there jaguars? We've got a third grade outdoor science program that goes on here, and it's literally amazing because a lot of the children have, have never been in the woods. See this plant just down the bank? It's like all these little green fingers. It's kind of a fan. When you ride back to the school, you won't see any dwarf palmettos, but if you look right now, you can probably see 10 or 20 of them. For students from urban areas, a field trip to a state park or a state natural area may be their first real chance to be immersed in nature. They're asked to observe what they see around them Here's a couple of and to get the feeling of things. So that you can make rubbing? Impact. That's the beauty of bringing the kids to a park. Oh, I see a tadpole. They actually get to come out here and see and feel and touch. And they get to observe nature right here in real life. It's here for them. Further west, San Angelo State Park hosts students of all ages. We have school groups, and it's anything from kindergartners to through high school kids that come out. Some groups come to study the herd of bison or learn about native plants or animals. You see, it's got little spines all over it, and that's part of its protection. Pat Bales prepares these kids to step back in time. Well, in reality, these are not dinosaur tracks. However, they're older than the dinosaurs. It's kind of neat to think that we're going to be walking where these animals walked at one time. We have uh, the largest set okay, well, of prehistoric Permian vertebrate animal step. tracks in the world right here in the park that predate the dinosaurs about 90 million years. Okay, some of these really stand out, like this big one right here. You can actually see the toe prints. We study dinosaurs in second grade science, but then they get to come out here and see it. Tracks of ancient animals. They get a taste of reality out here. Some of these kids don't see anything but four walls of a classroom and four walls of a home. Get them out in the country. Let them see nature. Let them live nature for a while. What greater classroom can you have than you know, right out here in San Angelo State Park. Back at Kingwood High School, as summer approaches, Mike Furry and a few students schedule one more visit to Galveston Island State Park. Not to add to their aquarium, but to return their living specimens to the Gulf. There's nobody in here to maintain these aquariums during the summer. And so the animal is basically our guest for the school year, then, then we return it back to the ocean. Don't try this at home. The release of non-native or diseased aquatic organisms can be disastrous to native ones. 
but Mike knows this and has their best interest in mind. Right, let's head to the beach. I always hoped that we would take the equal number of animals back, but, you know, some things get eaten. <laughs> Prey and predator relationship, you know, kids learn it real quick. All right, let's set everything down right here, pull off the shoes and socks. Okay, guys, why don't we decide what we're going to release first? The field trips that I take, and I would go to these places and look and see, yeah, even go. if I wasn't teaching. Pour most of it out. Right. When the kids can do something like that and have yeah, fun, here he, like, comes. here he comes out. I remember it. Is he in there? Yep, yeah. All right, let's walk out there and turn him loose. Today, a few fish and crabs return to the Gulf. But Mike Furry will return next year to catch a few again and to introduce a new group of students to the living classroom just down the road at their local state park. Maybe we'll catch you next year. Description I wear Enjoy fresh air and open space every day with the Passport to Texas radio series from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Through sounds and words, we'll transport you to places with green grass and blue sky, if only for a minute or two. And sometimes that's all you need. Passport to Texas airs weekdays on radio stations statewide. Visit PassportToTexas.org to find a station near you. And remember, life's better outside. This series is funded in part by a grant from the Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program. Through your purchase of hunting and fishing equipment and motorboat fuels, over $40 million in conservation efforts are funded in Texas each year. Additional funding provided by Ram Trucks. Guts. Glory. Ram.